many of the Ajahns, Ajahn Man, Ajahn Mahambua, Ajahn Cha, talk of the practice as being an act of setting up a fence around yourself. A lot of us don't like to hear that. We'd like to think that as we practice, we're opening things wide up around us. But there's an important sense in which this image of a fence is very important. It's very central to the path, because on the one hand you're keeping yourself in, so you don't go around creating trouble for others or getting into trouble yourself. And at the same time you protect yourself, that the fence goes all around and you're protected on all sides. And having the fence also helps you become aware of ways in which your mind is unruly, creating a lot of trouble that you might not have noticed otherwise. It's like when we're practicing concentration here. We establish ourselves in a one of the frames of reference, the body in and of itself, or feelings, mind states in and of themselves. Primarily, though, the body. You're focused on the breath. And any thought that doesn't relate to the breath, you just drop. You realize that that's a thought that's run up into the fence, run up against the fence. And you don't want to help it cut a hole through the fence so it can get out. You want to stay here, right inside. This way you get to see which of your thoughts are actually skillful and which ones are not. Now the thoughts can give you all kinds of reasons for why they should be let out of the fence. But for the time being, you make up your mind. Anything that's not related to what you're doing right here with the breath is not welcome. You're not going to encourage it. You're not going to open up one of the planks in the fence. And this way you're safe. The Buddhist image is of being in your ancestral territory, the place where you're safe. It's got that story of the quail and the hawk. One day the quail wandered out of its ancestral territory and the hawk caught it. And as it was being carried off, the quail admitted, oh, if only I hadn't wandered out. If I'd stayed in my own ancestral territory, this hawk would have been no match for me. And so the hawk hears that and is a little miffed, but doesn't say anything. He says, what is your ancestral territory? And the quail says, a field with clods of earth and stones all turned up. So the hawk says, okay, lets him go. So go back there, but even there you won't escape me. So the quail gets down in the field and stands on a stone and says, come get me, you hawk, come get me, you hawk. And the hawk folds its wings and comes swooping down. And just as the quail knows that the hawk is almost on him, it slips behind the stone and the hawk shatters his breast. In this image, the hawk stands for Mara. It can stand for any of your defilements. If you wander away from the breath right now, your defilements will get you. You stay right here, you're safe. And you want this fence to be all around. In terms of your virtue, your concentration, your discernment. Defense of virtue is really important. As the Jamahabu says, anything in your mind that would have you break any of the precepts you have to recognize is a defilement. In fact, anything that goes against the, the Dharma, you said recognize that as a defilement. And a good place to start is with the precepts. It's so easy to come up with excuses saying, well, things are complex and I have these other obligations and this one is a little bit too tight or tense. Those are all defilements. One of the natures of defilements is they try to make things complex so you can't figure out which way is right and which way is wrong. The precepts are there to cut through a lot of that complexity. You might say, well, I have obligations to my relatives or I'm going to lose the wealth that would be helping my children or somebody else it might be bad for my health. But the Buddha says, recognize that losses in those three areas are nothing compared to the loss of your virtue and your loss of right view. 
So he does recognize that there are complexities, but he also recognizes that the complexities are largely the work of your defilements, the things you want to hold on to. And you can come up with all kinds of excuses for it, as we see all around us. But if you really want the protection of the precepts, it has to be all around. As the Buddha said, when you adhere to the precepts without exception, then you're giving universal safety to the world. Now, they may not be safe from other people, but at the very least everybody is safe from you. And once you give that kind of safety, then you have a share in it, too. It's your protection, or as the image the Buddha gives. If you don't have a wound in your hand, then you can hold poison in your hand, and it's not going to seep into your blood. But if there's a wound there, you can't touch poison. It's going to kill you. In the same way, if you don't have the bad karma of having broken the precepts, that kind of karma is not going to come back and get you. So this image of offense is something that we should learn how to live with and actually come to appreciate it. Because if the fence is all around, it does protect us. Same with the Buddha's image of discernment. He says it's like a wall covered with plaster. The defilements are trying to get in. But because the wall is covered with plaster, they can't get any footholds, can't get any handholds. That way it can't infiltrate your mind. You have a gate. You have mindfulness at the gate, because there are times when your thoughts do have to go out and do have to come back in. You have to bring in things of the world and send your thoughts and other actions outside. But you want mindfulness right there at the gate all the time. Now, mindfulness is not just bare awareness. It's remembering okay, what's skillful, what's not skillful. And as you've learned how to live with this fence of virtue and this fence of concentration, you begin to gain a sense of which of your thoughts actually are useful and which ones are not. It's not like the Buddha forbids you from thinking ever again once you start practice. In fact, he wants you to think very carefully. But it takes a while to get to know your thoughts which ones you can trust and which ones you can't. They have a phrase in Thai, Swam Roy, which means if you want to sneak up on somebody and let, let them know that you're following, you step right in their footsteps. So then when you look on the path, they don't see the footsteps of two people, they see the footsteps of one. And a lot of our defilements are like that. They'll sneak out under the guise of a skillful thought. So you've got to be extra careful. Which means that your mindfulness has to be constantly alert and willing to learn new lessons. Things you thought were okay at one point, you begin to realize, okay, that can contain something unskillful. So it's because the defilements are there all the time. And we talk about them as they. But you have to remember that they are very skillful at making you think that they are you. This is your greed, your aversion, your delusion, your way of looking at things. This is what you feel in your bones. They get into your bones this way, through the breath. And it's one of the reasons why we stay with the breath, not only while we're sitting here with our eyes closed, but as we go through the day, is to learn how to recognize these little tiny things that get into your breath energy, and they can seep in. So even though you feel something in your bones, if it goes against the drama, recognize, okay, this is not something I want to identify with. My bones have been hijacked. And so you work with the breath to get them out. I told you about that treatment that a John Fuang had one time, where he had rheumatoid psoriasis. And rheumatoid psoriasis starts in the marrow of the bone. Now, getting medicine into the marrow of the bone is very difficult. So what did they do? They had him inhale mercury vapor, as mercury gets into your bones. And it's like having two gunslingers in your bones. You can have two gunslingers in one town, one of them's going to leave. The idea was that the mercury would drive out the psoriasis, and then the doctor had a technique for getting the mercury out as well, or so he claimed, or that it would actually work. I don't know, because John Fuyan died from other causes in the meantime. 
But the principle is there. So if you've got something in your bones, you've got to get something that goes deep into the bones to get that out. And this is where the breath energy helps. So when you have those feelings inside you, whether they're in your bones or in your muscles or wherever, you just got to do something. Your gut reaction tells you something, and you have to realize, okay, if it's going against the drama, you can't trust your gut. Okay, you get the breath to work in there, because the breath goes deeper. The breath is actually more immediate than any other part of your body. The energy flow that you've got here, okay, work with that to reclaim your body. And that gives you a better perspective on these various thoughts and feelings and urges that would pull you away from the practice, pull you away from what really is in your own true interest. Now, this may sound very dualistic, but it is. There's defilement and there's lack of defilement. There's dharma and non-dharma. And you've got both inside you. And it's important that you learn how to recognize which is which, so the fence is there to help you. If you run up against the fence, you realize, okay, something inside me is trying to get out, break a hole. But once you break the hole, then anybody can come in. So make sure that your fence is in good repair. And if you find any of your thoughts being like the bamboo or the bamboo barrier that go way deep down to find a way out, well, you've got to go deeper with your breath and deeper with your, your concentration. So that your protection is not only all around you in the horizontal directions, but above and below you as well. 